So um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Philip Dickinson and I'm a lecturer in the department at Lancaster and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Jason Allen Paysant. Jason is lecturer in Caribbean poetry and decolonial thought at the University of Leeds, where as of September, he also directs the Institute of Colonial and Postcolonial Studies. He joined Leeds in 2016 as a Leverhulme postdoctoral fellow after completing his DPhil at Oxford University. His academic research is on cultural memory in the African diaspora and combines and moves between various disciplinary and methodological approaches, um, theatre studies, performance studies, poetics, literary criticism. His creative writing, poetry, memoir, critical life writing, addresses issues of time, race, class, and the environmental conditions underpinning black identity. He's published in a wide range of high profile venues as an academic and a creative writer. And if you want to hear more from Jason after today's talk, you can hear him on BBC Radio 3 tomorrow night on the show Free Thinking, discussing the writing of Emmy Césaire. So um, there will be time for um, some questions afterwards, we think, um, and I'll talk a bit more about how we'll um, manage that um, at the time. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Jason. Thank you so much, Philip, for that generous introduction. And thank you to both you and John for the introduction to, to the invitation rather to speak. I'm looking forward to it, needless to say, very much. And uh, to the interaction after the speech as much as to, or or perhaps more than what I, I'm, I'm about to say. Uh, so the title of my, my talk as announced is Blackness and Landscape, Writing enclosure, writing against enclosure, square brackets. I'm thinking and talking about writing enclosure as much as writing against enclosure. I have provided another sub, added an, another subtitle to, to the presentation today, um, and it's Reclaiming time. Reclaiming time is a, is a is an idea that I'm working with, and hopefully that should become should become clear during the presentation. The link between that and the original title. Without further ado, I'll jump straight into it. I aim to talk for about thirty five minutes, uh, giving us ample time to interact and to ask questions. Why do I now want to talk about the woods? After all, I grew up surrounded by woodland. In Coffee Grove, the village in Jamaica in which I spent my early childhood, I was surrounded by farmland, by animals and by the bush. Why then had I never felt this urge to stand still in the woodland or walk placidly contemplating it. I realized, as I express in the poem, walking with the word tree, that for my family, nature was functional. As, as farmers, my grandparents shaped the land, waited, waited for its yields, saw their living as connected to the earth. They were not contemplators of scenery. Their hands were in the earth. Later, at the age of five, I went to live in a town with my mother, who was a school teacher. All of a sudden, I was propelled into a different lifestyle. We would continue to be poor, but now at least we lived in a small town. My mother, not, uh, my mother never got coming out of the bush, quote unquote, to coincide with upward social mobility. And this must have been a, a source of frustration for her. Poverty creates feelings of enclosure. We, li we are living a half rural, we were living rather, a half rural, half urban life, always with the aspiration of leaving the rural behind 
because the rural was perceived to be an index of poverty. And that's why we never stopped to think about nature. On the one hand, we were trying to escape the rural elemental lifestyle. On the other hand, we couldn't afford the trappings of middle class lifestyle. We went to the beach once a year, for example. Now that I think about it, the whole idea of middle class in Jamaica is about turning your back on the elements. The middle class ideal entails distancing yourself from the natural, the woodland, any space associated with the primitive, quote unquote, and that includes folklore and myth in which the woodland is the space of spirits, dopies as we call them. Given Africans from ancestral practices, blacks in the new world were forced to internalize a colonial epistemology of nature. The fact, for example, that African spiritual practices, including pharmacopoeia and various healing practices, were viewed as suspect by the colonizers, rendered more problematic an already complicated relationship to the land. The urban space is the locus of progress. Nature belongs to the rural, not the urban. The bourgeois cult of nature is not a phenomenon you will encounter in Jamaica. So in the small town of Poros where I lived from the age of five, people pave over their front lawn. Not everybody does, of course. There is this obsession with covering the green. Modern upward mobility is concrete. The fracture that we experience between ourselves and nature the desire and obsession to put distance between ourselves and the natural world is rooted in slavery and colonialism. We try to distance ourselves from the quote unquote poor condition of living with the earth. To compound matters, violence and criminality deter us from venturing into the outdoors. Landscape and the possibilities of landscape are underpinned by socioeconomic dynamics rooted in colonial history and its afterlives. History, the past and present of social violence, made woodland in Jamaica a place of leisure. We live in a deep-seated social fracture that keeps us distanced from the natural. The question of blackness and landscape is a complex one. For the black body, walking is complicated, and to walk in a dark, veiled place is seldom an innocent act. Histories of the haunted black body form part of the collective memory of the African diaspora. If the city often proves to be a dangerous space for black people, as recent events have demonstrated, the fact is that in the black imaginary, it is the city that is perceived as the site of relative safety, and I underscore relative, while the outdoors continue to be associated with the uh, to quote Fred Moten, um, quoted in um, the paper of uh, a, a colleague, constant necessity and activity of running away, of flight. How then do we walk? How then do we inhabit leisure? What is nature to us? I am thinking about spatial enclosure. To what extent are my past experiences and feelings of enclosure rooted in colonial ideologies and histories? Past experiences um, among the black community in general. My current pro poetic project is one of writing against enclosure, as I have said. Allow me a slight detour away from poetry, the better to underscore the concerns I engage in my poetry. While thinking about these issues, I encountered the work of photographer Ingrid Pollard. I have been particularly interested in a series of photographs Pollard took and exhibited in the late 1980s. It is quite interesting that the issues Pollard was grappling with in the 1980s are still just as present today. In pastoral interlude, Pollard takes familiar sights and makes them legible in new ways, playing with the viewer's sense of what seems natural or not so natural, forcing us to give attention to the ideological workings of landscape. The photographs involve reading the ways that land has been marked, culturally speaking. 
In the first photo, which I displayed to you before this recording began, a black woman, perhaps the artist herself, sits on a stone wall. Behind her, a fence marks one boundary of a landscape of rolling hills. She is clad in white jumper, beige trousers, tucked into mid-calf height, green socks, her head wrapped in a green, in a green scarf. She sits with a camera on her thigh. Her eyes look intently at something, th something outside of the frame. Whatever it is, she seems to be watching it with curiosity. The caption begins, it's as if, I quote, it's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment. I thought I liked the Lake District, where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white. The evocation of Wordsworth in I wandered lonely as a um, so on, so on, so is of course evident through the ironic evocations of Wordsworth, uh, ironic, iconic poem. <laughs> the artist challenges uh, uh, the romantic associations attached with or attached to wandering on foot through the land, leisure, relaxation, finding oneself, and so on, while highlighting the absence of bodies like her own in the landscape and in cultural representations of the English countryside. There is an ambivalence in the speaker's feelings. The artist depicts herself as wanting to be there, as discovering the pleasures of the Lake District. I thought I liked the Lake District. And at the same time, as feeling a strange sensation of unease, of dread, to quote the, the, um, the caption to the photograph, the suspension dots suggest an ongoing question, a kind of inability to fully explain why such feelings of unease should exist and persist. Wordsworth's poem speaks of rest, the rest that allows one to observe the daffodils, quote, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, unquote, and the rest that such an experience gives to the mind. By contrast, the body language of the woman in the photograph does not strike me personally, at least, and I'd be interested in hearing your takes, as being entirely restful. Her facial expression and her knees and her legs and knees that press against each other such suggest rather a state of tension that she might not feel entirely safe in this environment. In one interview, Pollard was asked whether there was, an, a, was any personal experience that triggered her interest in the British rural, its mythologies and overwhelming whiteness. She replied, I quote, just going on holiday. We only had a couple of holidays as a family. We didn't have that kind of income, but we went camping a couple of times. When I left my parents, I used to go with friends to the Lake District. I wouldn't see another black person for a week and you would notice it was hard. My white friends would be going to relax and it would, and it would create anxiety for me. I appreciate the countryside, but it wasn't particularly relaxing. I just wanted to do something about that." End quote. My forthcoming book, Thinking with Trees, considers blackness and nature from the perspectives of time, race and class while interrogating the cultural and geographical meanings of landscape. These poems evoke the environmental conditions underpinning black identity, while urging us to imagine alternative futures. The book follows a Caribbean tradition of weaponizing language through irony and does so as a means of challenging social, racial and spatial boundaries. It engages a Jamaican lens on the British landscape and British ways of life while reflect, reflecting on my changing identity, quote unquote, as I negotiate the shared and constructed space of landscape. Thinking with trees grapples with the fact that spatial exclusion grows into the literary field as well. In the eyes of publishers and readers, nature writing is a white concern. They bemoan the dearth or non-existence of black nature writers. They ask, where are they? Are black nature writers not interested in nature and are black writers rather not interested in nature and ecology? The question is loaded with a set of assumptions and ossified ideas about nature, about black writers, about the human being in relation to nature. It fails to acknowledge certain realities about the relationship between blackness and landscape. It is ignorant of history, 
of the undemocratic aspects of landscape and of the things that nature, quote unquote, might mean in non-white imaginaries. Those who can afford time. Who wanders lonely as a cloud with three golden retrievers? Not me, no, not me. I could never understand this poetry, never understand what the poem was saying and how this could be poetry for me when my English teacher drilled the imagination of a white man's country. I didn't know how, but somehow I knew this wandering was not for me because ours was not the same kind of time or wandering never so accidental, so entire, so free, as if nothing was coming, as if no hawk was near, as if they owned the land and the mansion on it, as if tomorrow and forever was theirs, as if they had the right to take their time because everything about them was refined, was secure. So Wordsworth's poem never made sense. I'd never stop to listen to the poems about trees and mushrooms and odd cute things and birds whose names I could never pronounce. My poetry was Tom the Village DJ. It was more material, I said, than the woods, than the lives of those who loafed and bought their time with money, I thought, those who had all the time in the world. Where the relationship between blackness, nature and history is concerned, a few observations are necessary. I will state these boldly. Firstly, in disrupting relationships with nature, dwelling practices, colonialism disrupts ways of knowing the world, knowledge practices. Secondly, the work of coloniality is based on control over nature. Thirdly, part of that control is the control of the othered, that is dangerous, out of place, to be controlled, black body. The assimilation of the, of the black to nature is central to the functioning of coloniality. But this is, of course, paradoxical, since while the dynamics of coloniality assimilate the black to nature, it also at the same time separates her or him from it. In the New World, as Sylvia Winter points out, the African, quote, himself served as the ox for the plow of the plantation system, which brought about the technical conquest of nature, unquote. The history of European colonialism in sub-Saharan Africa relieves, pardon me, re reveals similar logics with respect to the control of bodies and land. Yet, in the New World, the African presence rehumanized, quoting Winter again, nature and helped to save his own humanity against the constant onslaught of the plantation system by the creation of a folklore and folk culture, end quote. The Africanist construal of the land as always earth, the center of a core of beliefs and attitudes would constitute the central pattern which held together the social order. Through sacred rituals, dance, drum rhythms, forms of earthing, through possession rites, masquerades that enacted the drama of the gods, Afro-Caribbeans created a different temporality. Thereby, they maintain a sense of the sacred and the affirmation of ancestral ties that bind the community to earth, enabling humanness despite social death. The results of these attempts to grapple with a new nature are well known. Haitian Vaudou, Santeria, Obia, Pocomina, the Orishas, the Shango Baptists, Rastafari, among other forms of sacred practices that sought to animate a life whose aim was to produce groundless individuals. However, these forms of resistance, if they help to create alternative temporalities and perpetuate ancestral worldviews, pardon me, If they help to create alternative temp realities and perpetuate ancestral worldviews, 
also highlight the nature culture fracture that begins during slavery and persists today. A part of slavery's violence was that the enslaved was excluded from responsibility for the land in which she lived and worked. To quote Malcolm Ferdinand, our relationship to land, our ability to relate to earth in a certain way determines our freedom, but also another fundamental human urge, which is the urge of belonging. Here, it is worth pointing out, as Raymond Williams has done, that the etymology of nature ties it to native and also nation. How does a black history of exclusion from land influence how we think about black futures in nature and the environment? I had been busy writing poems about the police and black cops killing black people and black anger and rage and that kind of stuff. And then I realized that the time we spend pouring our souls into that kind of writing and thinking robs us of time. There is no doubt that we must continue to write about these issues. We have no choice. But I'm forced to think about the relationship between coloniality, racism, humanness and time. This brings me back to my work and its central theme of time. The observation of process is a political act linked to a reclamation of time. It highlights the fact that racism pushes us into an attitude of always reacting to hurt, anger, provocation, exclusion. This is a theft of time, a robbery of the connection we are meant to have as humans with real life. In that sense, the poems in Thinking with Trees are an expression of my taking time in a societal context that creates the environmental conditions that disproportionately rob black lives of the, of the benefits of time, leisure, relaxation, mental and physical well-being, etc. Right now, I'm standing beneath what used to be, I imagine, an impressive tree. It is split down its bowl, it is still alive, has sprouted green leaves that will be rustling way into September. But at its base and lying athwart the clearing is the severed part that looks so dead and yet so alive. The color of brown has weathered to near gray and the footfall of walkers has covered the wood with a layer of dust. And yet the part that has fallen among the spikenard and hungry shrubs seems so alive in its death, disintegrating and flourishing, frail and green, the raspberries feed on its breath. The beetles thrive in the slurry middle where the bowl rots. Process, the wax and wane of objects, the feeling of life coming into me, the feeling of self as part of life. Slowness, I'm talking about time, a defense of time. I'm talking about the robbery of time from black life, I'm talking about the ability to be slow. I'm talking about the ability of our bodies to be here. I'm talking about the ability of my body to be in the woods, thinking about people, the people who find me strange because I'm just stand, standing here. The people who look at me while talking, look at me suspiciously because I decide to stand and listen and look because I'm not going anywhere because I am just standing. I'm thinking of how we have been workers. I'm thinking of how my ancestors have been the workers, just the workers. I'm thinking of the Congo and how a Belgian king had a land almost 80 times the size of Belgium as his personal estate. I'm thinking of the cruelties of work among my people. I'm thinking of my ancestors who were slaves. I'm thinking of rest. I'm thinking of slowness. I'm thinking about reclaiming time. I'm talking about reclaiming what middle class people call leisure. I realize now that I've missed all what I have missed all these years. Poetry is the expression of a profound connection with life. Listening and seeing are our avenues of connection. And this is poetry's gift that through poetry, I can stop, listen, observe and participate rather than simply react. The purpose of racism is a life that is constantly reacting, being affected, being hurt, being angry. 
Poetry's gift is a different sense of time, not one marked by utility, accumulation, greed and blind progress. In a word, the logics of capitalist accumulation and its bourgeois ideals that produce wars, genocides, varian, various human catastrophes. Poetry's gift to me is a sense of deep time, and that is its sense of wholeness, of connection. Poetry is a reclamation of time, of connection rather than reaction. Inevitably, the poems do sometimes convey my sense of unease and uncertainty while in the veiled hidden spaces of the woods, but they also highlight the fact that I must be there. The sun splashes its light on the trees. Their exposed skins glisten. The evening glow penetrates me and I move into it. Inside me, a living thing is ripening. In this month of December, when night falls in early afternoon, it is a struggle to get here. And now that I see it, I am living. I was made to live, not to schedule appointments or solve clashes on an online calendar. I was not meant made to spend a day in front of my computer. It seems ironic to be saying these lines at the moment. There is a sadness that returns, a sadness for the boy I once was growing up in porous. What was my poverty? Wasn't it living in a space that was too little, not being able to go very far? The poverty of being blind to living and a slave to always doing. We had no time to waste. To go far might have been just to enter the woods behind the house, but there was a wall separating me from it. The positioning of the black body always outside of land, with all its privileges in regard to leisure, well-being, health, um, always already outside of land with its privileges in regard to leisure, well-being, health, and so on, is a key aspect of the narrativizing of power and of the determinism that shapes geographies of blackness that inscribe black culture as always already within urbanized space and much less within the outside spaces, quote unquote, unquote, of freedom, leisure and escape. The consequences of the disproportionate exclusion from land and land as leisure have been powerfully demonstrated in recent times through the inequalities revealed throughout the COVID pandemic the issue of the pernicious effects of unequal access to land on physical and mental health and well-being have suddenly become no longer a matter of theoretical gesticulations, but of vividly obvious power structures and embodied realities. And of course, I must stress that I, I realize the intersectional nature of these concerns, cutting across class, as much as it does about uh, um, across race um, and gender, Plus, uh, even. While everyone was, quote, under lockdown, quote unquote, at least in theory, the access to natural space everywhere, anywhere from a backyard to a manorial estate was clearly not a given for everyone. Likewise, therefore, the ability to cope, quote unquote, with the state of exception that had been created a coda. I'm really not interested in hearing any more middle class people screaming that black, pe black people shouldn't be going outside at all. When your back garden is the hundred acre wood written by one at Sammy Lou on Twitter. Let's, written to, let's return to the question posed earlier. How does a history of colonialism that has weaponized land against black lives in the Caribbean, Amer America, Africa, and Europe, how does a black history of exclusion from land influence how we think about black futures in nature and the environment? I propose that a black future in nature must include an altered relationship to time. I have come into a, an awareness, into awareness, I want to challenge this construct of time. I think we can do so collectively through art, 
art offers to racialize people an alternative space an alternative mode of being a counter analytic to babylon and art for us must be togetherness community a way in which humanness becomes a matter of connection again we must form connection around the type of consciousness that frees us from the system with the biggest from the consciousness of the capitalist machinery that seeks to devour us that implies the need for solidarity and if solidarity involves connection to the more than human world, then it also necessarily, then, not, then it is also necessarily connection amongst ourselves. This is where I have got to, and that concludes my talk, and I look forward to hearing your reactions, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Jason. Um, yeah, I guess it's one of the weird things about yeah being stuck in front of a, of, of a, of a screen that there's no no applause or kind of sense of uh, uh, immediate response or appreciation for that talk. But um, that was uh, absolutely fascinating and, and really um, exciting and, and, and provocative talk. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of um, Q&A, um, what we thought we'd do is um, use the chat, and I, I hope this works okay, so that um, I'm going to talk um, a bit, uh, or I'm going to maybe have some questions of my own for, for Jason, but I'd really encourage you, um, if you have questions, to put, put them in the chat, um, and then I can, can and then I can feed them in. But I guess, uh, Jason, I guess it might be okay if people feel comfortable sh showing themselves. That they yeah, absolutely. Have, yeah, better. I'd, I'd, I'd like that better. <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah, yeah. So, so Probably should we you can do both, I suppose. Sorry? Perhaps we could do both. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So if people want to ask a question, but but don't feel like they want to um, sort of um, show themselves, then, then then put it in the chat and I'll I'll try and feed it through. And um, if people want to ask a question, then put your hands up and um, I'll call on you. Um, so right now there are lots of people in the chat just saying thank you for such a, a provocative and interesting talk. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can read them and thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. So um, so please feel free to put a question in the chat. Um, please feel free to put your hands up um, and I'll, I'll call on you. But maybe I'll ask a, a, a question just to just to get us get us started. Um, which is just, I guess, the question about you, Jason, and sort of your relationship to different um, forms of critique or, and different forms of expression. Um, so you're an, you're an academic, you're a poet, um, you use elements of um, memoir in, in 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 your talk today. Um, so um, what? What kinds of, um, I guess, what kinds of um, principles in, inform the sorts of formal, uh, formal or choices you make? Um, and I suppose as you were talking, I was kind of thinking about the the black radical thinkers that you're drawing on too, like um, Sylvia Winter and Fred Moten and stuff, and how they seem to have a, you know, they're sort of at odds with certain forms of academic norms and academic conventions too. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just sort of an open question about um, you as a thinker and, and you as a writer um, and sort of what informs the, the, the different elements that sort of um, feed into um, your work. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a, it's a good question and thought provoking one. I, um, I've been a poet for I've considered my po myself a poet for a while now. I'd say the last eight years, eight nine years or so, um, which coincides to when I with when I came to this country, which is also very interesting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. Um, 
all along, uh, uh, I would typically see my poetry as existing in a separate space from my critical and academic writing mentally. And increasingly, I'm asking the question, how can poetry be um, a form of critique operating on it in its own way, in, in its own right, standing in its own right as a as a mode of critique. Um, and uh, I've been experimenting with that. I've, I've been looking at that in my in my work. Uh, uh, it, through through my research, looking at. Poets who. View some sort of philosophical dimension in poetry, some necessary philosophical dimension. And um, in additionally, poets who play with, you know, you mentioned Fred Moten. I think he's he, he's probably like, shot me as an example of somebody who's constantly doing those crossovers. But yeah, I mean, the short answer is I've just seen how the possibilities really for for not viewing airtight divisions between these categories anymore and just looking at how poetry for me uh, feeds into my critical practice and conversely my critical practice feeds into my poetry what i write and you know even perhaps how, how i write um that, that's 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 what i think anyway that's what i can say from my on my part yeah 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 no that's that's great um yeah I and mean, i think you can kind of see the sort of you know the sort of poetic sensibility i guess in in the way that you know uh, you know you're, you're developing your, your critical thinking too um, yeah 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 i suppose i felt also that poetry here really embodied the subject matter of what i was yeah yeah well yeah yeah I guess time, I guess, you know, yeah. that, that question of what poetry does with time versus what, you know, a sort of academic essay does with time as well. Um, you know, time is something, um, you know, the academic essay has to has to kind of get to its point, I, I guess. Um, I don't know. That's, it, that, that's really interesting. Sort of more instrumental relationship to time or something. Um, yeah. Um, um, Alison, um, uh, has has a hand up and wants to ask a question. Okay, uh, can you hear me and see me now? Yes, I can. Well, yes, perhaps I can, I can, I can start, start off by by saying, you know, on behalf of everybody who's written up comments, you know, thank you as the first person to speak. Thank you so much, Jason, for a, a really provocative and fascinating talk. Um, I, I, was, I was especially interested with what you were saying about poetry as a, a reclamation of time and space, working almost alongside each other, two, the two of them. And I wanted to ask you about sort of the length of a poem, um, what we were thinking about in relation to essay, critical essay and poem. A poem gives you that chance, as you were saying, to be slow, to do something different. Um, does a, does it? Does this matter in terms of what kinds of poetry or poetic forms writers are appropriating? I'm thinking of like sort of big epic poems like mm. Omeros by Walcott um, mm. and or performance poetry as another kind of a, mm -hmm. um, a, a kind of appropriation of time and space in the immediate moment. Mm. So I just I'm wondered just what making you a... your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. What what comes to mind uh, when you you mention epic poetry, for instance, is something that is operating on a long time scale. That a time scale that exceeds the human, the individual human. I'm sorry, I should. I don't know if that's me, kind of. Um, no, I can hear that. That's good. Um, no, no, no. I was saying uh, I needed to turn off my email because it, I'm getting some pings here. Yeah, I'm just thinking how how epic operates on a long time scale, a time scale that in, exceeds the individual human, and even an individual human life. Um, and that 
makes me think of temporality as well and how we view ourselves within the world so that the, the, the epic subject matter is something that pushes us beyond ourselves into a greater sense of community, a greater sense of a, of a, of a larger whole. Um, and even with respect to the history of epic poetry, if you take the Homeric epics, for instance, um, that tradition of poetry and of voice sometimes sometimes contrast sharply with our ideas of of poetic voice today because that tradition of that 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 instant that idea of poetry involves um a, a shared voice it involves um connections insofar as um there is a form of orality there um there is a form of speaking that immediately tells you that this is a question of generations of of one poet speaking uh, and transmitting to another and to another and to another ad, ad, ad infinitum um, and so you know and and as you know a lot of scholars posit or, or think that homer is was was not just one one individual you know, it's, there's, there's that collective, in other words, simply put, that, that collective dimension of poetry, that sense of poetry as a, as a vitalist connection between human, and vitalist embodied connection between mm -hmm. the human being and the, and the world, that we often lose in our sense of writerly poetry, that sense of... Um, poetry as an individual solitary activity <laughs> and I think that's how I connected to I think that's how I connect poetry to temporality that deep sense of um, of embodied connection between human beings but also between the human being and and the external world really I, I hope that makes sense as uh, as an answer. Yes, I mean, just from what you were saying, what was coming out to me, and I don't want to hug up lots of time, but there seems to be a oh, almost a gap between what you were saying about leisure and the immediate moment of the kinds of work that you were reading us mm -hmm. and that notion of responsibility to generations and to retelling a story, almost like the fighting that you said was necessary and that is robbing um, people of time at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm. yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, John, um, John, you have your hand up. Hi there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jason. That was wonderful. Um, my, my, I'm picking up partly on the, the, your your reference to Babylon toward the end there, um, <laughs> as you move deftly from the critical voice to a poetic voice and and then blurred the distinction, um, which I. Which begged, made me wonder about Jewishness and the Jewish resources that might relate to um, time, and particularly the idea of the Sabbath uh, or mm. Sabbathness as somehow a day without time. Um, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the resources of the Sabbath, if you like. Uh, that's an interesting question, John, and no, I hadn't thought of it, about it. But uh, I'm I'm really I'm really happy for that that <laughs> comment and that that possible that that possible connection there. But do you want us to talk about your okay? And I'll shut up in one second. Do you, do you want to talk about um, pick up on the Babylon thing? And that... Yes, yes. So I was go I was going to say yeah. that as you already know, um, the. Babylon as a metaphor for capitalist, uh, you know, the more pernicious aspects of capital, the capitalist system is something that comes from Rastafari. Um, they, 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 that, 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 that sense of Bab Babylon as, a, as an ellipsis to refer to, you know, um, a lot of the things that I, I was talking about, really. Um, 
but that 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 comes from the from the from the Jewish text that that comes from the the Psalms, um, and and specifically, uh, well, perhaps many points in the in the text, but um, the specific Psalm that talks that begins, if I forget the O Jerusalem, and that, and that goes on to talk about by the river by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and, and wept um, because we remembered Zion. Um, is this pian about, uh, about loss, uh, about separation and a yearning for possible reconnection? Uh, and that is, a, as, uh, that is a, a great parallel to align with to, to, to kind of transpose onto some of the that, that this this issue of separation and loss and reconnection that we're talking about. Uh, and it's no coincidence that that um, how should I put it that that movement of thought is is essential to Rastafari to the to the Rastafari um, movement, you know, which sees itself very much as, as a, 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 a kind of a, a counter, counter logic, a, a different paradigm, you know, different way of thinking, simply put, to the overall capitalist system. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful for that, looking at Babel. And I, you know, I write that unconsciously, you know, as, as yeah. <laughs> Right. But uh, but but perhaps yeah, as you say, there's some, it would be interesting to look at the the Jewish texts and that Jewish philosoph that Hebrew um, Jewish philosophical tradition um, and how that that connects. Yeah, thanks thank for that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, there was a hand that. Oh uh, yeah, um, Yasmin um, has has a hand up. Um, Yasmin, are you, are you there? Yeah, can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. Hi, Jason. Can now. Hi, Yasmin. Great yes. to see you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for your your talk. I have so many questions and and thoughts. Um, some may be random. I'll, I'll throw them out there. One one thought I had um, from like a an aesthetic, from a purely aesthetic perspective, I was just thinking about your title, um, blackness and landscape, and whether there's a kind of um, yeah, sort of um, conflict there, or, or, or a, a supposed conflict there. I was thinking about the impressionists in particular, and the fact you know that they they they. They were famous for not using black because they felt that black didn't exist in nature mm. and therefore um, they needed to be as chromatic and as far from black as possible. And I guess I was just wondering for you visually when you imagine blackness in, in, in landscape, in nature, what just whether you have some visual impressions things coming to mind because it's true i think when we think landscape and nature we think um we think light and we think green and maybe mm. there's also somehow there's some visual um work to be done there um i mean of course there were also works um challenging that that notion of nature as something kind of saccharine i'm thinking of like manet's déjeuner sur l'herbe and you've got the the men in their kind of the the, fe the female nude, and then the men in their their black suits. But yeah, I'm just I guess I'm just wondering um, what you could what you picture. I don't know as a poet um, first first and foremost when you picture how we would have like blackness as a as a as a tone or as a I don't know if is that a bit of a random question. Yeah, no, it's not. I really like it. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Because I really like it because it's fascinating. Um, because uh, I, I don't know if I if I have a an answer or or a straight answer to that. I I 
there, I mean, there, there are instances when I think about color, literally. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, in, in this poem that I wrote about daffodils, which is a kind of, uh, it's a very ironic um, poem that's, you know, the daffodil is this iconic thing. And of course it, you know, evokes words, Wordsworth, you know, um, immediately and this sort of thing. And that, that, that color, that yellow, that, thing is you know as an image is something that stays with us even when we think of landscape I dare say even with us from the Caribbean you know who learned that poem in our tropical city <laughs> never seen a daffodil so yeah I mean your question is interesting in that sense because in that poem um, I take it the, the whole challenge in that poem is to say, can you think of daffodils differently? Mm -hmm. um, can you think of, of daffodils being held in a black hand, you know, mm -hmm. a, the hand of black families walking? So in other words, can you just reverse, um, sort of like um, change that you see, mm -hmm. change, the, change the picture mm -hmm. so that, yeah, I guess I'm just thinking simply just put some more black in there. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Yasmin. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Sam has a question. Hi there, hopefully my microphone's on now. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jason. Hi, that Sam. Really wonderful. Hi there. Um, so my question is about ground and groundedness. Um, so you mentioned how different Caribbean traditions explore a grounding in nature through various um, spiritual traditions that they've inherited from Africa, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking how that works for your own poetry or in a sense doesn't work. Mm. Um, because in a sense, you're moving into this space where your poetry gives you this space to reclaim time. Um, but at the same time, you want to think of your poetry as in some sense a mode of critique. And what comes across most clearly is, is in a sense, your presentation of the image of a black person in what we associate as a white landscape. And so your poetry becomes more a mode of interrogation than a mode of grounding. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered about that opposition and whether you would also want to say that your poetry does ground you and whether there are any like spiritual traditions that you were moving, that you actually do draw on, or are you in this kind of quite um, vulnerable space really where there's a kind of groundlessness to your poetry mm -hmm. yeah, in the yeah. sense of its inter interrogatory nature? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, there's so much to think about there, uh, or or so many ways to answer. But I'd I'd say the 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 vulnerability seems vulnerability as an idea um, as a descriptor of the po the poetry seems just about right to me, um, and that that tension between groundedness and whatever its opposite is um on un ungroundedness mm -hmm. um seems seems about right as well um that 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 that's a tension operating in in the poems i i um i'm a, I've, I've become aware of 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 something um, through through doing recording this lecture on the lyric the, the on lyric poetry for my first year students and thinking about the the lyric eye and the 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 history of the lyric and you know what it what is as what what it has meant um, and how lyric the lyric um, often sees itself portrays itself as this radical ind individuality you know the individual looking out at the world so so which means you know the individual is dis disconnected it's not so and and then my poetry me now thinking about organic organicity and connections but but i am using a lyric tradition you know my my 
voice as you, you know you hear the po the extracts in in that presentation the resonance um and the um the resi residual presence i wouldn't even say residual presence i would assume it's a strong sense of lyricism um poetry so i've been thinking about how that kind of pushes up with some of the things that i'm exploring namely embodied connection namely namely connection just you know um so i th i think there's a there's a kind of tension there where you kind of it, it it's like there's no clear cut separation possible from in my, my poetry at least as it stands here separation possible from a western poetic tradition you know i'm i'm very much operating within it but i'm trying to also subvert it in in meaningful in meaningful ways you know and one of the ways i see myself as subverting that lyric um that generic tradition of the lyric is in doing what others have done as well including europeans including you know western westerners and it's that sense of you know i think of mary oliver for instance as a as a white american writer um that way of fracturing the eye by looking at how it um our, our co-naturalness with the world um fractures our our sense of like like an airtight subjectivity you know like a, like like a um just this masterful subject um really so uh a, a lot of the poem my poems resort to this kind of animistic um relationship with the, with landscape and with objects kind of looking at objects as having a personhood of their of their own you know kind of looking at trees rivers uh mushrooms i don't know like just elements of nature as having their own personhood their own their own their own their own spirit spirit basically and 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 looking at that you know de like depicting the subject the, the the speaker as in through that lens if that makes sense so yeah that's that's how i think that i'm reckoning with um groundedness grounding and you know with with all the tools that i have yeah i hope that's a kind of it makes sense as an answer to your question no that's brilliant and even mentioning mary oliver was wonderful because i <clears throat> i used her poem about the geese in a reading group with refugees mm -hmm. and one of the refugees had exactly that response um that you had you know it, she and she wrote a poem in response called this poem is not for me precisely mm -hmm. the space of nature is a space of uh escape or leisure or a space of freedom uh, yeah so that I, I love the idea that yeah, in a sense the nature poetry grounds you but it also disturbs the tradition of nature poetry itself uh, Preci precisely precisely thank you uh, yeah that's that's uh fascinating that was a really fascinating answer i thought um so sorry at the risk of kind of reimposing a kind of regime of time here it is two o'clock um so i guess this is the kind of conversation we'd usually sort of carry on afterwards but um I, I guess not in these circumstances unfortunately um so i just want to say again just just thank you so very much jason um for that for that wonderful talk and for answering those questions so generously um and thanks to everyone for coming and, and, and thanks for, for, um, for those questions too. Um, so um, I guess now it's, um, it's time for us to say, say goodbye. Um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Philip. Thanks again, John. Thanks for, to everybody really, for engaging with the talk and for your lovely questions. Helpful as well, thank you. That's fascinating. Bye.
Yeah, that was. Uh, is John talking? You're on mute, John. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I'm just sneaking back in. So others do feel free to, to linger. I'm just <laughs> saying the obvious, namely, thank you both. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for facilitating. Oh, that was really Yeah, that was just. Uh, that was so great, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> like, um, Very yeah, well. Yeah. Um, seemed like it was the kind of conversation that could have carried on for, for quite a long time. Um, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I could see it. <laughs> I see <laughs> that. Yeah, like that possible, possible, like other questions, many other questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was good. It was.